Thank you all for joining us this, joining us this afternoon. I'm Cecilia Rouse. I'm the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the 2013 Connor D. Riley Distinguished Visitor in Leadership and Governance, Melody Barnes. Uh, Melody is a former uh, colleague at the White House. She's a former director of the White House Domestic Policy Council. Well, until January 2012, she provided strategic advice to the president and worked closely with members of his cabinet, coordinating domestic policy across the administration. She played a major role in the president's um, education agenda uh, from, and you'll know this expression, from cradle to career, uh, where she uh, worked hard at expanding and improving preschool, at improving K-12 education, at reforming student financial aid, and importantly, especially during this recession, improving workforce development. She was also central to the administration's early work on immigration and many urban issues, such as strong cities, strong communities, at which works with local leaders to help them better leverage federal opportunities more effectively. Prior to her time at the White House, Melody was the Executive Vice President for Policy at the Center for American Progress. She served as Senator Edward Kennedy's Chief Counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and she received an appointment as Director of Legislative Affairs for the U.S. Equal, Oppor Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. As great comfort for many of you, she began her career as an attorney, so it's not lost if you decide to go to law school. Uh, as an attorney with Sherman and Sterling in New York City, and she holds degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Michigan Law School. Currently, Melody serves as CEO of Melody Barnes Solutions, a domestic policy firm, and is vice provost for global student leadership initiatives and a senior fellow at the Robert Wagner School of Public Service at NYU. Please join me in welcoming Melody Barnes. Well, it is such a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And I have to admit, uh, one, the idea of being here in September made me feel like I was getting the chance to go back to school again, um, which after you've been out for a while is a delightful experience. Um, but two, it was also a wonderful opportunity to see my friend and former colleague, Cece. I can't tell you, and you probably know how lucky you are to have her as the leader at the Woodrow Wilson School her intellect and her collaborative spirit were things that I counted on when we were both in the White House together. So it is a pleasure to be here with you. And it's certainly a pleasure to engage you all in what I hope will be an interesting conversation. I do want to say I almost feel like apologizing because I'm not the president of a country. Um, and <laughs> you all have a week of them this week. So, But you know, thank you um, for, for being here. So as I indicated, um, or as you will probably know, I want to talk about leadership and innovation and policy innovation in particular, and imposing the fact that I believe that states and localities are in fact the new policy leaders, particularly at this moment in time. And so why, why do I think that? In particular as a person who has spent most of her career working in Washington, D.C., in the House and the Senate and the White House and think tanks, um, and about every imaginable environment in Washington. And that's for a, a couple of different reasons. One, I would offer up political line drawing. And we only have to look at what's happened in particular over the last few decades to congressional di districts and the, the homogeneity of congressional districts now to see one reason why policy conversation in Washington is not moving as quickly as one would hope. It was designed to be slow, but I don't think anyone imagined that it would be quite this glacial. And, and I would offer up an example of a district in Colorado that used to be uh, led by Tom Tancredo. And for those of you who follow immigration policy, you would know that Tom Tancredo is no friend of immigration reform. He left the Congress, and his seat is now occupied by Mike Kaufman, who shared a similar view. The lines were redrawn, and Mr. Kaufman's district now includes a number, a large Latino population, and he, without blinking, did a complete 180 degree turn on his views of immigration reform. And we can debate the pros and cons of what happened and why, and the substance of that, but I would suggest that the fact that he had to listen to, he had to engage with, 
and in fact his political livelihood depended on listening to those who had different views on immigration led him to a different perspective. That is the flip side of a lot of what's happening in Washington today where whether you are on the left or whether you're on the right, those lines are drawn in such a way there, that there isn't the kind of robust engagement and dialogue that one would want and certainly that would play out in Washington, D.C. Secondly, I would offer, um, based on my experience, and obviously I come from a particular um, ideological point of view, that the debate that began 30 or so years ago, well, actually longer, has its roots um, in a period before that, around small government has actually morphed into, for some, a debate and a position that is the equivalent of no government. Um, and in fact, there is an antipathy toward Washington, D.C. and the work of the federal government that now pervades public policy conversation in Washington. And that has led to not gridlock, but has led to a level of obstruction in the policy pro process in Washington that, again, has contributed to this glacial, glacial change. And as a friend of mine who actually serves in the Senate now said, says, people often talk about this as gridlock, as though all the cars ended up in the intersection at the same time and no one can move, when in fact it's more like several cars got there and blocked the path of movement and therefore we don't have movement. That's not gridlock, that's obstruction. And then I would also suggest that the communications apparatus that's built up over the last few decades, and I was talking about this or we were discussing this and a class I was in earlier today has also contributed to this. And again, this is not ideologically based. Whether you're on the left or, you're, or the right, people now are able to watch news that actually just reinforces an opinion that they already have. It doesn't necessarily shed light. It often adds more heat. But it doesn't necessarily present facts in an unbiased way that can help people to think critically about information. And in addition to that, there's so much information. I don't know how you start your day or how you move through your day, but by the time you check Twitter, by the time you look at blogs, by the time you're on different websites online, there is a mammoth amount of information to go through. And without a certain amount of, of discipline, and in some cases, even a level of expertise, it's hard to navigate all of that. And it's certainly more comfortable to settle into a particular television show or news show that tends to allow people to sit and to calcify in their policy positions. As a result of that, I think that Washington has come to almost a grinding halt. Certainly, big things still happen. And as I said before, certainly Washington and the federal government was set up originally to move very slowly. But I don't think this is what was in mind. At the same time, what I have been excited to see is what's happening on the local level. What's happening in cities and towns around the country, and to some degree, what's happening in states around the country. And I think, to some degree, because people who are involved in this process are living in the communities that they want to change, because they feel the implications of many of their policy decisions or the lack of decision in a very concrete way, because you look in the eye of your neighbor, that person that you work with, and you recognize the ability to forge change, to work together, to collaborate, that it can spur the opportunity for change to take place in those more on the ground environments. There are several different examples of that kind of collaboration, of the kinds of tools that are being used that create that kind of change, that lead to that kind of policy conversation, and in many places, innovation. Again, we talked about this in one of the classes that I was in earlier today. There are public-private par partnerships. And those partnerships, we look at efforts like reinvest, um, a partnership that's supported by philanthropy, like the Rockefeller Foundation, that's put in you know, several million dollars to support 
efforts to create resilient infrastructure in cities and towns all over the country. And by bringing together technical experts and policy experts, the philanthropic community, they're not only developing these innovations and these smart policy ideas, but they're also collecting the data and the information along with that so that those ideas can spread and can scale and can be used in other places around the country. Not far down the road from you, you also have innovative leaders. You know, people, you know, people love them, people hate them, but certainly Mayor Bloomberg has been an innovative leader for the city of New York. It doesn't help when you've got a few billion dollars of your own foundation to help um, spur that kind of change, but I also think in all seriousness, it also takes a certain level of of gutsiness, a desire to try new things, a willingness to shake the trees, a willingness to break some China to, that would lead you and lead your administration to move forward with some of the innovative ideas that he has. Work around anti-poverty, for example, um, and the desire to study programs, to look at anti-poverty programs, make decisions based on data as to whether or not some will continue, to eliminate some, in spite of what friends and allies might want, and therefore to put money into the ideas that you see are working. Ideas like EITC reform, for example, or his work around nutrition. Some people dislike that work. You know, it's led to cries of the nanny state, and certainly there's been blowback um, with, as a result of some of the work he's done. But I don't think we can quibble with the fact that he's been willing to be innovative and to use different public policy tools to try and drive the debate forward. I also think there's been a shift that's taken place out of the traditional move from people going from local government to state government into the federal government and seeing that as a move up the ladder to those who have been working in the federal government and deciding that working on the local level, working in the, on the state level, is an opportunity for even greater innovation, an opportunity to try new things. So one of our former colleagues, now the mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, is using any number of different tools, ideas that you know, I think we can both see some of the things that we talked about and worked on in the White House, and trying those out and doing it more quickly, going deeper in the city of Chicago than we were able to do in, on, on the federal level. You also look at examples like uh, Governor Brownback, Republican of Kansas, conservative, someone that I used to work with, that we used to work with on immigration reform, who's doing the same kind of work, for example, in education and trying to test out new ways, building a task force of experts, accountants, and others to figure out ways that we can, there can drive, they can drive more money into classrooms in Kansas and to do that in an innovative way. Um, putting in place a report card in Kansas so they can test out the ability and see using benchmarks whether or not more students are persisting, get, they're graduating from high school, they're going into college, what their, um, what their high school <coughs> dropout rate looks like, is that dropping, what the effect is of the different initiatives that they're trying. But the thing that I want to talk about more deeply today is a tool that I've spent some time not only looking at, starting in the White House, but also trying to implement in the work that I've been doing at the Aspen Institute. And that is the tool of the cross-sector collaborative. And again, this, it's, it was interesting to me that this came up in some of the classes that I attended and some of the conversations that I had with students earlier today. I think cross-sector collaboratives have found, been found to be one of the most successful ways of driving policy change in local communities across the board. What we've seen is that when nonprofit leaders, private sector leaders, when uh, philanthropists, when local and elected and appointed officials, faith-based leaders work together in these cross-sector collaboratives that they've actually been able to move the needle in a significant way. Clearly, collaboration is not new. It is, in some ways, as old as time. But what I would argue is that this is a different moment for this kind, of, this kind of collaboration. That, in fact, some of the elements that lead to our frustration around policymaking in Washington and policymaking in general 
have actually made the moment where cross-sector collaboration may be the tool that helps to move us forward. And I want to use an analogy that for a minute may not seem directly connected to any policy conversation. But you know, as my husband and I often say to our architect, stay with me for a moment. <laughs> so I bet many of you, whether you know, your most recent business travel or as students when you were coming here um, in the fall by train or by plane, that you used your suitcase and that you rolled your suitcase <coughs> through the airport, through the train station, through the bus station. I will be dating myself by saying I remember a time when that was not the case. I remember, I can still see my father when we go on those family vacations for two weeks in August, carrying, literally, <coughs> carrying those heavy plastic suitcases of ours down the front steps to the car to put them in the trunk. So how did we get from there to the next step? And this is probably around college. I don't know, some of you may remember those silver steel things with those big kind of rope-like hooks attached to them and you put your suitcase on them and then you'd hook your suitcase onto it and you'd use that to roll it through the suitcase. And that was considered to be innovation. Well, we move from that to now that, I was thinking about it today when I got off the train, that suitcase with the wheels built in. The eureka moment for the rollerboard suitcase actually took place in the 1970s. But it wasn't until 1987 that it really caught on. And a number of things had changed to take what had been an invention and out there in the market to something that all of a sudden many people wanted to use and to buy. So what happened? Well, first of all, more people started to travel by air. And airports started getting bigger. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I remember when our airport was teeny tiny. And now, you know, you go through airports and some of them you feel like you're going mile to mile to mile to get from one gate to another. Two, more women entered the workforce and started to travel for business. And, you know, I consider myself to be in pretty good shape, but do you really want to carry your suitcase through the airport? No. Three, the thinking of manufacturers was that men would consider it not to be, you know, they wouldn't be so tough if they had a suitcase with wheels. Clearly they were wrong. <laughs> so all of a sudden, what you had was this confluence of events that led to the rise of a product that had been sitting there to become the standard, to become the norm. It was a market-making moment for the rollerboard suitcase. So how does this apply to cross-sector collaboratives and policy change? I would argue that this is a moment where we have a confluence of events and elements that, are, that leads to the focus on and attention to this kind of policy tool. You know, one, we've got the frustration with what's going on in terms of policy making in Washington and at the same time, significant challenges, pick your challenge, energy, education, healthcare, the list goes on and on that we want to confront. Two, the innovative leaders that I, would, that I was talking about before. And innovative leaders who are also looking at data and metrics to discern what works and the willingness to do that. Three, again, because collaboration is not new, because collaboratives aren't new, this is a muscle that's been used before. And one of the things that we studied when I was still, when I was the domestic policy advisor, so we looked at different communities all over the country to see what was working on the local level. We saw collaboratives, why they were working, the cross-sector nature of those collaboratives made them different. And then there were some other particular elements that I'll talk about in a second that made them particularly successful. And then finally, because there's a field that's growing around this. There's a discipline growing around it. There's a, a level of attention and study that's happening to support and peel away the layers around this to understand why it really is successful. Collective impact is what has emerged in the context of this conversation about cross-sector collaboration. So John Kenya and Mark Kramer, some of you may know either or, or both of them, 
of a group called FSG, started out as an organization that studied foundations and philanthropy, wrote an article in 2011 for the Stanford Social Innovation Review that specifically looked at this issue of collective impact. And what they found was that collaboratives that went beyond just kind of the we link arms, kumbaya, we get along, let's do it together, but did some things that were very, very specific were much more successful than others. One, they shared a common agenda, a very specific common agenda. Two, there was a diligence around shared measurement. Again, this goes back to this idea around data and metrics and benchmarks to measure progress, particularly when you are working with organizations across sectors and many organizations focused on this common agenda. Three, there were mutually reinforcing actions. So it means that you don't have you don't have to have everyone working on the same thing. So in education, everyone isn't working on K-12. But in order to get to this result that we want in education, you have some that are working on early ed, some on K-12, some that are focused on persistence and access to, to higher education. I just use that as one example, but you have many different organizations that are working towards a, one goal, but their actions are reinforcing and supporting each other. And then finally, and second, I'm sorry, fourth, there's continuous communication. People aren't operating in vacuums, they aren't operating in silos, but there is a dedication to this idea that they have to work together and to communicate with one another about what they're trying to achieve, where they are, what's working, what's not, so that if you're failing, you fail forward, you can get rid of what's not working. And if you're succeeding, you can share that information across your collaborative. And then finally, the importance of a backbone institution or organization. That trusted entity that can call the meeting, that can bring people together, that can help keep this collaborative together, and again, focused on that goal, focused on, those data, on that data and on those metrics. In addition to that, what we also found was that there were, for the most successful collaboratives, resources that were being put into the tools that make and the infrastructure that let those collaboratives work. Often refer to this as the non-sexy stuff. So everyone you know, wants to focus on, you know, how can I give money to help that adorable child that needs help? People are less inclined and less interested in how can I give money to build a data system. I mean, let's, let's be honest, one of them sounds a little less interesting than the other. But those kinds, that kind of infrastructure is absolutely necessary if these collectives, if these collaboratives are to succeed. I think a great example of that, I'll give you um, three short examples of these kinds of collaboratives. Um, on the local level and then also on the state level. One, the STRIVE Network. And this is a collaborative that we studied when I was at the White House. I created the White House Council for Community Solutions that was looking at this kind of work. What's successful on the local level that can help drive policy faster and more aggressively than we are able to do on the federal level? And we looked at different communities around the country. Some of them were doing work on teen pregnancy. Some were doing work on uh, bringing down youth crime, cradle to career education, pick your issue. STRIVE is one that many of you may be familiar with, but focused on cradle to, um, to career education. It started in southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, bringing together uh, the community college system, um, higher other higher education players, also bringing together nonprofits, the philanthropic community, and the business sector to focus on the way that they could ensure that more kids were moving from early education all the way through college into a successful career, and one that would allow them to earn a life-sustaining wage. This partnership started in 2006 with the goals that I just mentioned. And what they found in their first five years of working using this particular strategy is that of the 53 educational outcomes they, that they collectively were focused on, that they had made improvements in 40 out of those 53. 
9% rise in kindergarten readiness, 11% increase in high school graduation, a 10% increase in college enrollment. And those numbers for that scale are actually significant numbers. And when we were looking at this at the White House, we were looking for um, collaboratives that had at least a 10% change in whatever area that they were working on before we could consider that to be significant. As a result of their success over those first five years, in 2011, they created the Strive Network with the goal of being able to scale the work that they were doing around the country. And as a result today, there are Strive, -like, Strive networks that exist, or Strive collaboratives that exist in 34 states plus the District of Columbia. But in every single case, they had to commit one to the idea of benchmarks, which is really, really tough. I mean, I'm sure there are those of you in the room who have worked on the ground, looking at my former colleague, Lauren Dunn, who I know was doing that in DC. That is hard, hard work, and it's expensive but it's something that they insist upon. And secondly, that everyone had to participate in a community of learning or a community of practice. One of the things that I've also seen is that we can have collaboratives all over the country that are working on the exact same thing that don't know that the other exists. People are replicating mistakes. Why would we want to encourage and give momentum to the creation of more mistakes when creating this community of practice and learning can help people in real time better understand what's working and what's not. So there's a commitment to that and the commitment to creating at least 15 proof point communities across the country, again, at least 10% change all over their baseline by the year 2015. As a result of what we saw with the Strive Network, one of the things that the White House Council did was make recommendations for what the administration could do, what the federal government could do, but also realize this isn't going to just happen because the federal government. Local change isn't going to happen just because the federal government wants it to be so. So there was a call for the establishment of an outside organization leading to the creation of the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions and the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund. This is an organization that I've been chairing, but is led by a tremendous executive director named Steve Patrick, um, who knows this area extremely well, and a deputy director, Monique Miles, both of whom have extensive local experience and experience dealing with a particular population of opportunity youth. The idea here was to do two things. One side of the coin to continue to study this area of collective impact, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But secondly, to specifically focus on a big national problem and to use that study and that work as a proof point around the effectiveness of collective impact. So the, the decision was to focus on what we call opportunity youth, what most people, a number of people call disconnected youth, 16 to 24 year olds, disconnected from education and disconnected from employment. It can be young people who have dropped out of high school. They can be young people who have a GED but who have not gone on to get a post-secondary credential, fallen through the cracks of the foster care system. Those who may have gotten some kind of certificate but they're not in, a, in a, the kind of job that actually could sustain a family. So how do we ensure that the 6.7 million these 6.7 million young people, and most people believe that's an undercount, are now reconnected to the education system, persist, and go on to have the kinds of lives that we hope for them. We did an economic study as a way to try and start to galvanize the conversation. Recognize that this is a challenge that costs the nation about $93 billion annually. And when you look at the lifetime, and that was in 2011, and when you look at the lifetime cost, total cost, societal cost, taxpayer cost for that cohort of young people, you're talking about, you're talking over $4 trillion that have been lost. So wouldn't it be better to use our resources to address this challenge? So our goal is to focus on building pathways for opportunity youth, and that led to the creation of an incentive fund a fund that would allow us to put our money where our mouths are, 
to help to fund the collaboratives in local communities that are focused on working across sector and at the same time supporting these young people by building and strengthening these pathways. We just announced the first 21 communities that we'll be funding. They are urban communities, tribal and rural, so that we can get a better sense of what works and what doesn't in those communities. Ultimately, we will also be doing a policy study, a finance study that looks at the amount of federal resources um, and in different places, the state and local resources that are devoted to this population of young people so that we can better understand how those resources can be leveraged, can work together as opposed, in, as opposed to in di distinct silos um, and can be more successful. And the third and final example that I would use is on one on the state level. And that is in the context of healthcare and what's been happening in the state of California. I imagine there are at least a few Californians in the room. One of the things that we see when we look at California is that California has recognized its healthcare challenge for a very, very long time. And I think because California has been has also recognized that it's been on the forefront of demographic shifts and healthcare challenges for such a long time. You know, understanding that they are the state that has the largest total number of uninsured in the country. Also recognizing that nearly one in four workers in California is uninsured. And also recognizing that with a significant undocumented population, that they have a significant number of people well over a million who have no access to any kind of preventive care whatsoever. And that has implications for the broader population. So as a result, for quite some time, California, <coughs> across ideological lines, started organizations and entities in California have started to work together. Leadership has come from the insurers, I remember having conversations um, with the former head of California Blue Cross Blue Shield, Bruce Bodakin, and his philosophy and his view on why they had to be engaged, why California, and this is before passage of the Affordable Care Act, had to work hard to try and resolve this challenge. And just to give you a brief sense of that perspective, Bruce said the following, health insurance is built on an implicit communal social contract. Unequal access to health care represents a breach of that social contract, a breach that threatens to further widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots, between the worried well and the suffering sick, and undermines the economic balance that's necessary to maintain that system. He goes on to talk about the importance of universal health care and the fact that we have to lead, our path has to lead to greater efficiency and greater fairness, and at the same time, that while universal health care is no panacea, it doesn't deal with some of the large challenges around poverty and unemployment that face the country, it is a critical first step, and he said, in starting to solve those problems and reaffirming that social contract that is the underpinning of the employer-based health insurance system. And that's coming from one of the lead insurers in the state of California. You also had a number of organizations, philanthropies, and business that started working together years before we start, before this effort started in 2009 to move forward with health reform. So a major public health education campaign by the California Endowment, which is the largest philanthropy in California that focuses on health care an effort to unite partners and to think about driving a unified message and doing that in a consistent and repetitive way to start to change the perspective that many Californians had about universal health care and why it's important. You had the legislature moving 2006, 2007 to pass pilot legislation um, to start to focus on ways that they could work with various um, uh, specific populations to move health reform forward, and then ideologically diverse, multi-sector collaborative that was being built 
out of several different coalitions, including hospitals and doctors and nurses and insurers and the private sector and the philanthropic sector. And now what you see is that that coalition or those coalitions have come together to start to work to implement the Affordable Care Act. And those coalitions, again, have exercised that muscle. What we saw is that years before the Affordable Care Act was passed, you had foundations in California that were working to fund stakeholders across the state to work on health reform, to work to change the message, to work on en um, enrollment and work on Medi-Cal issues, to get children involved and enrolled in the state um, child health care programs. And those coalitions started to work with the private sector on those issues as well. So you had Kaiser Permanente, you also had the California Community Health Foundation, you had the California Endowment, they were all working to support and to fund the building of those kinds of coalitions. You, and today, as a result of that, what we have is a set of organizations that have contributed literally hundreds of millions of dollars to move forward with implementation of the Affordable Care Act and to do that with a set of partners that they have been working with for many, many years. So common agenda and shared measurement, they have focused on that. They know what their goals are with regard to enrollment. They set a, spe a specific target there. They also have come together and have put in place a set of metrics to determine how they're going to get there from where they sit right now. Mutually reinforcing actions and communication. You have the philanthropic community and NGOs working together with the business sector and a list of chamber organizations, restaurant associations, associations which on the federal level are often fighting each other in this implementation, but in California have come together to try and implement the health care law. You also have a major media and communications campaign that's done, given their, the demogra demographic um, complexity of the state in multiple languages and going deep into the grassroots, into communities all across the state. And the partnership with organizations and trusted organizations around the state to do so. So while California, I wouldn't say that California set itself up and said, we want to use collective impact. What I would argue is that because of the way that they have been working for many, many years, you look at the success that they're having today based on the goal that they set for themselves and you can see that the elements of collective impact are there. So what does all this mean for policymaking? as I wrap up? I think one, that it means that even as we think substantively about policy change and what the content, what the actual policy should look like, we also have to be focused on the strategies that are encouraging adoption, that are encouraging innovation, scale, and efficacy. I would also argue that as we're doing the work in recognizing that there is no single solution to big complex problems, that we also have to be concerned about learning and ongoing real-time learning and the sharing of information at the same time that we have to develop the field and the discipline that's going to support this kind of tool for successful policy change. That's work that at the Aspen Institute we've started doing in collaboration with FSG, with United Way, with other large institutions that have strong, a strong presence in local communities to build a community of practice, to build the tools and to build the knowledge to scratch on what's working and what isn't, and to be honest about that so that when we're failing, as I said, we can fail forward and that we can share why, why we are being successful. And the creation of a digital hub that will put that information out there in a way that is accessible to communities all over the country. Um, so it's the sharing with the public, you know, through stories and narratives and working with communications outlets to do that. It's using the social media and blogs to do that toolkits and white papers and videos and every tool imaginable to try and share the information that we're gathering as we continue to try and discipline this particular field. 
And also, I think, going back to the feds, it's creating a feedback loop so that what's learned on the ground can also be shared on the federal level. And you can look and see some of the architecture for that. In the class I was in earlier, we talked about Social Innovation Fund, the Investing in Innovation Fund, or I3 in the context of education, where resources are putting, being put out to encourage innovation on the local level and experimentation on the local level, collaboration and partnerships there that in turn can inform what happens on the federal level as well. So I'll conclude by saying this. Often when I talk to people about this work, and I talk to people and they ask me, well, why are you working so hard now on the local level? Why are you working now more often with states and thinking about what states are doing in towns and cities? You know, does this mean that you've given up on the federal government? And my response is that I will never, even when it seems crazy, give up on the federal government. I think that a, an effective and efficient federal government is absolutely necessary for this whole grand experiment of government to work. But at the same time, I realize that what's happening on the state level and on the local level right now is extremely exciting. That we are seeing the kind of change and change happening at a, at a faster rate than we often see it on the federal level. That there's a focus on innovation and digging down into tough problems to working often across ideological lines that we often don't see on the federal level. I, I believe that and hope that that can inform what happens on the federal level because, you know, as my former boss, Senator Kennedy, said to me once, and when I asked him how he could continue to do the work he had done for 40 plus years in what at that time seemed to be a very, very tough environment, and he said, when it works, it's magic. And it is magic. It, it absolutely can produce extraordinary results when we work together on the federal level. But it requires a level of pragmatism. It also requires a level, an, a certain amount of data and information about what works that can be supplied to us by what's happening in local communities right now. So I continue to be committed to that work. But at this point, I am also excited about the ability to work on the local level it isn't easy. Creating trust on the local level, which is essential, is hard, it's brutal, it takes years to create that. Building these systems that are so necessary to understand what's working and what isn't is also hard and requires trust so that organizations are willing to share information across their lines. But change is happening. And when it works, it works and it inures to all of our benefit. So I don't see this as an either or proposition, but I do see what's happening on the state and local level as important to contributing to the big challenges that face our country today. Thank you. Hello, Hi. my name is Ben Horowitz, I'm an MPA2, and I actually worked for a collective impact organization this summer that started to address poverty issues in Philadelphia. Which one? Um, shared Prosperity. Okay, they so, work with Project U-Turn? I'm sorry? Uh, what, did you work with Project U-Turn? Uh, no, actually Prosperity? it's, um, the mayor has sort of rebooted their community okay. action agency as a collective impact organization to, <laughs> leverage their CSBG dollars, but that's, right, that's just it. details. But okay. um, 
So um, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you were saying, and I think that the turn towards the collective impact is really inspiring at the state and local level, but at the same time as I was working there, I saw the state um, sort of dig in and refuse to address a $300 million budget deficit mm -hmm. in the city's um, education budget. So we were sort of dealing with this issue of talking about poverty issues and how we need to talk about the whole picture and then not really talking about this huge fight that was coming up. And the justification for that was what I see as the other rising narrative in state and local discussions, which is that there's this competition between the states and the localities to make it as friendly for economic development as possible, which usually entails cutting revenue sources. So I'm wondering if you see that sort of uh, Rick Perry going to California and saying, well, if you come to Texas, you don't have to deal with health care. Kind of counter narrative, I guess, anti-collaboration across states. Do you see that as a problem? And is there any way to address that that you've seen at the federal level? And just to understand better, you're talking about collaboration across states. Can you just crystallize? Yeah, I guess maybe there's the, like the regional gas house initiative and things like mm -hmm. that where states are actually collaborating, but not so much, and, and maybe not so much collaboration as much as not trying to compete by cutting revenue and cutting services, which I think might distract from the question of how to use those resources better. I don't know if you can do both at the same time or if there is a way to do, I'm sort of confusing myself now, but. <laughs> well, let me tackle, I think, what is part of your, your question. In terms of the scarce resources um, that are sitting there right now, it's happening at every single level, you know, local, state, and federal. And the question is, how do you go about um, doing positive things, or I'm framing this as a question, how do you go about doing positive things and moving the ball forward when it, it, people, you know, policy leaders, elected and appointed leaders are consistently looking for ways to try and, and cut budgets and to defund programs as opposed to <coughs> providing additional funding um, in places where we see it's necessary. You know, I, I think that one, without question, you know, that is a challenge and that's a problem. But one of the things that I've seen and one of the, you know, some of the work that we had to do as we were looking to make cuts um, and we had to address, and the president wanted to address, you know, budget deficit issues and wanted to try and shrink the budget, and at the same time wanted to lean into, you know, change in areas of education, anti-poverty, you know, kind of the list, the list goes on, was to use, A, this theory and this idea around data-driven decision-making and what's, work, what's working and what isn't. I think that calls to question a lot, some very difficult questions for a number of communities. And it's one I know that I had to deal with and I have had to deal with in my time in the House and the Senate as well as in the White House. And it means A, that you have to measure and B, that at a particular point you have to make decisions about what is and what isn't working and make decisions about what you're taking off the table so that you can put more resources into um, those things that you see as being being successful and I'll give you an example one of the things in the context of education that we looked at early on when I was in the White House you know there was formula funding that's going out and then there were also efforts that we were making on education reform and there was a lot of consternation about uh, the fact that we weren't putting more money into formulas and that we were trying to use resources to galvanize the kind of reform that we thought was important and necessary in the areas of, of education. And people were saying, you know, but this is something I can take home to my community. This is something that we desperately need. And we were using that as a policy lever to try and move to support education, but to do that in a smart way. Um, I use the example of, of Mayor Bloomberg. I mean, there was a study that, that CEO did, the entity that looks, you know, you're familiar with, anti-poverty efforts. And many of those programs, after a few years, he said, these four or five programs just aren't working. I'm going to take the money out of those programs, and I'm going to use that money to try and 
uh, support reform, as I mentioned, around the earned income tax credit. Because I think that that's a, great, a smarter way to try and drive anti-poverty measures and efforts than some of these programs that aren't working. So in other words, I think to some degree there are choices that have to be made about what is and isn't working. I also think there's collaboration with the um, private and the philanthropic sector, another topic we discussed in the class today, that also can help and be a partner in some of that collaboration. But without question, that's a very real policy challenge. Hi, um, my name is Kat Johnson and I am also a second year MPA student. And before coming to Woodrow Wilson School, I was actually working with an organization that was trying to apply the collective impact methodology to housing homeless people mm. in communities across the country. Um, and we noticed that in the communities where this really didn't work, a lot of times one of the issues was that the individual organizations or congregations or businesses that were involved were really worried about getting credit for the results mm -hmm. that happened across the community. Um, and often there were really legitimate reasons for that in terms of funding and being able to get support. Um, so I'm wondering if you notice this in other areas and if you think that there are funding or policy mechanisms that could be implemented to decrease that. I, I do. I mean, I think that's an issue. Um, I also think trying to identify the right backbone organizations is an, is an issue. Uh, and often there are institutions that are larger players that have you know, a bigger foot, a bigger footprint, um, that get all the credit, um, that have in larger infrastructure, more name recognition, greater na name recognition, that often take on those roles. And sometimes more effective organizations that may be smaller get crowded out from that. Um, and it's one of the things that we, that issue and that set of issues are those that we're starting to look at. Um, and that's the kind of work that we want to do through the hub. And additional training for communities so that they can sort through those issues, understand the distinct roles that uh, backbone organizations and other organizations play in a collective, um, and how they can work in a more collaborative fashion. But I think to some degree, some of that also depends on the hard work that happens community by community, um, and the trust that has to be built, um, an honest assessment of who does what well in those communities before they're able to take on the role and actually move forward as a collaborative. That's why in the work that I'm doing, we, we funded most of our communities at, an implement, at a development grant level as they are continuing to work through some of those issues. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Mo Tracy Mooney. Obviously, Race to the Top is a model that the administration has used now across several issues, and I was wondering if you could talk about if that's a model that you think would be effective and should be pushed at the state and local level as well, or if there are different dynamics that make it less appropriate or less effective there. And do you, first of all, hi there, how are you? <laughs> do you mean using the competitions as? Yeah, in terms of money to incentive reform. Um, I think competitions are certainly a tool, you know, again, we were talking about this in a class I was in earlier today, we were talking about different financing models and mechanisms that can trigger change. You know, competitions, prizes, um, we were talking about social impact bonds, a number of different things, and I think they can be successful. I, I think we were, even though in a crisis moment in 2009, um, what we had, which rarely comes around, is a significant enough amount of money that it captures people's attention um, and starts to bring people to the table. Um, that is a variable that rare, doesn't often exist and makes that more challenging. But I, I also think, and what we saw was that even the communities or the states that didn't get race to the top funding, I've talked to a number of people in years since and they've said once we got to the table, we realized that we could work together in a different way, in a way that we hadn't before, so we continue on with that, with this work. Um, so it, it may start to spur a level of collaboration that didn't exist before. And that was one of the benefits that we saw, you know, out of the context even of, of specific race to the top winners. Hi, Melody. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, my name is Laura, and I'm a senior in the Wilson School. 
My question is about the key drivers of success that you've seen when scaling local initiatives to a broader or even national level. So you brought up um, some examples, but I was wondering, is, are there any key pieces that you think are really the most necessary? Like for example, my research interest is in K-12 education and sometimes we see that small areas of success are very hard to replicate because of the impact of a few just very inspiring people in a small local setting. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about that and share other pieces that you think are crucial to the scalability? Yeah, and we, um, <laughs> I keep feeling like I was referring back in a class earlier today, but we were talking about, I was using the example um, around a similar question of the Harlem Children's Zone and Promise Neighborhoods, which are really, really hard. I was referring to my former colleague, Lauren, who knows this on the ground, really, really, really hard to do that on the ground. But when we first started looking at what Jeff Canada was doing at HCZ, one of the things that so many people said was, Jeff is such a charismatic leader. You know, you can't replicate that without Jeff. And Jeff was like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but we started, I mean, A, they started to focus and study exactly what was happening at HCZ. Um, to see what made it successful. Um, and again, you know, I keep going back to the importance of looking at that data and collecting that data um, to understand what's actually working and what isn't um, for replication. Uh, so I, I think studying those models is important. Um, but also in the work that I've been doing and as I've talked to others who are doing this kind of work around the country, you know, and we focus on scalability, you know, we're looking at what's happening at the, with the Social Innovation Fund, um, and we are starting to get to the point where they will be able to extract information from the SIF to see what's scaling successfully and what isn't. You know, the, the, the initial point was looking within a certain set of parameters of, you know, what's been proven to be effective to what's been proven to be you know, pretty highly effective. I mean, that's where we felt was a safe zone to use federal dollars to fund um, and using those kinds of, of metrics um, and also depending on intermediaries that were local who had a better sense of what was going on with those organizations in local communities than we could know at the federal level. Um, also for the, for the success of scale, looking at what systems you can put you can use to try and put smart ideas into the bloodstream more quickly. Um, so as opposed to just focusing on what makes a program successful, what is it about a set of programs that have been deemed to be successful that can you know, work with community college systems, that can work with you know, public school systems um, so that you can start to affect change more quickly, and then how can you link those systems to one another, which is also very, very hard. I mean, it's one of the things I see in the work that I'm doing now that probably is one of the biggest hurdles, that the foster care system doesn't, isn't necessarily talking to the K-12 system, isn't necessarily talking to the juvenile justice system, um, so how do you create those linkages, and that's some of the work that we're trying to do, you know, a bit, a bit at a time. So I'm struggling want to welcome questions from the community as well. Hi, um, my name is Nick Sarasua and I am a second year MPA student. I had a question about um, navigating the insider-outsider relationship that may sometimes arise when working with different communities other than your own. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that trust was an important factor when working with these communities and that it takes several years to build. Is there kind of like a systematic approach that you take in order to earn that kind of trust or is it just different based on different communities and how do you kind of navigate um, those partnerships? I mean, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, Part of what I've seen, and, and as we have started to work with communities, is that we don't go in and say, hi, we're the Aspen Institute, and we're here to help, um, or we're here to tell you what to do. That instead, 
we go in and start to talk to the local leadership and start to work with people who have been doing this work on the ground for a very long time. Um, because I think part of what often what happens is that people feel, and this is common to any relationship, that, with, that there's a lack of respect when you walk in the door and think you understand the shoes that they've been walking in. Uh, and upon doing that and then identifying where, where you see the gaps and, and the challenges, but what they've also articulated as the gaps and the challenges and the problems, trying to help, and one of the first things we're doing is helping communities to map the assets that exist um, in their community so they understand everything that's available to them. You know, also the resources that we're putting into those communities go to, as I said, kind of the non-sexy things, you know, go to the creation of the data systems, go to the support for backbone organizations and, and their leadership. So the kinds of things that they need but haven't been able to find in other places. And then to also assess and work with each community as where they stand and where they sit. And we believe that we will find some common themes across communities, but we also recognize that Greenville, Mississippi and Hopi, Arizona are gonna look very different from each other and from Los Angeles and Baltimore and Philadelphia. Um, so while we think that these communities can learn from one another, um, and we think that there's information we can glean from each community that we can share with the, the, wider, the wider world that will be useful, we aren't going in with a cookie cutter approach to try and impose a particular set of solutions on communities. We have a particular set of goals that they share, but not a particular, a specific set of solutions. And I, I think that that is important when you walk into, when you walk into, I'm thinking of any number of, of policy um, experiences that I've had, much less when you're trying to do collaborative change. And then you have to understand what's happened there before you even got there. Um, you know, why that organization is angry with that organization, or you know, which leader insulted somebody else 15 years ago and they haven't gotten over it. Um, because all of those things create, create a history. Um, but the hope is that when you put in place you know, an infrastructure that looks towards measurement, that looks towards data, um, that has people aligned around a goal, um, that tries to spread you know, the credit around um, that you can start to build that trust over time. But I think every community will, will be quite different. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Adam Kent. I'm a second year MPA student here. Uh, my question is kind of like looking into the future uh, with the role of state and localities. Uh, there's a, a lot of states and cities are facing big pension uh, issues moving into the future, and I'm wondering if this, in, if you think the innovation that we're seeing now is somewhat of a function of scarcity of resources from the federal level, and moving into the future, is that, it, are the is the scarcity of these resources actually going to really hurt innovation and and collaboration at the state and local level? Well, I I always, you know particularly for the kinds of challenges that we're talking about, you know, that I've been working on, you know, a dearth of resources when people are struggling and suffering um, in profound ways is clearly problematic. At the same time, I think it can breed innovation and invention because you get forced um, to have to go there, but I, to say that I don't worry about the, the kinds of cuts that I'm seeing and the level of austerity that I am seeing in certain places, you know, I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I, I think we hit a, we are in some cases at a point or beyond a point and others getting to a point um, where you are cutting through, you're cutting into bone and ultimately that will slow down the kind of innovation um, and the kind of growth that we want to see as a country. And I, I am particularly concerned when I think about the demographic shifts that I see 
taking place in the country. Because I think the, the shift in demography can be a very exciting thing, can lead to greater innovation. But if we are under educating, um, if, you know, youth, if we are denying um, health care services um, to individuals and families, you know, the list goes on and on, then we are going to end up in a situation where the, our country looks very, very different. You know, I think something about like the year 2020 or so, you know, the majority of um, working age people um, over 18, something like that, will be people of color. I mean, it's, we're getting to a point where if we don't pay attention to how we are educating and supporting and nurturing um, populations of people, then our entire country is going to take a hit for it. And that certainly will affect innovation and growth in the long term, um, and everyone will, have to, will be paying the price for that. So yes, I, I, I do worry about that. And at the same time, I do see, you know, like in the stimulus context where we had a moment and we had resources and we thought we can use this to try and drive some <coughs> policy change um, that hopefully will catch on and take root in, in states and localities. Um, so there is a, a very careful balance about, you know, when, when the crisis goes so far and the decisions made around the crisis go so far that you've just inflicted pain and, and hurt yourself for a generation or two. This is right where you're at. I retired from the Department of Correction. I noticed that a high percentage of minorities were there, many of whom can't read. Mm -hmm. Adults that can't read. I don't know in the juvenile system, but I noticed that. My concern is what effect it would have if those were targeted and the communities identified even to the neighborhoods what effect it would be in the socioeconomic area if they could read and if that, those kinds of um, parts of the population are being identified for targeted uh, projects. Mm -hmm. uh, well, A, I think a absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we look at for success as people are trying to get you know, kind of middle skill jobs are the lack of competencies um, and certainly um, reading, analytic abilities, communication skills, um, collaborative, you know, that set of, of what we've been calling soft skills, but I think that's a bad name for it, um, are, are extremely important. Um, that has led to some of the work that I'm doing and I know others are doing um, to focus on those young people that have been identified as, as disconnected. I know of others, I have a friend, um, David Domenici, that I used to work with uh, at a charter school in Washington who is very specifically working with states to build an improved education system inside the juvenile justice system. Um, so there are those kinds of efforts underway because when people are leaving the system, if they leave without any skills at all, I mean, we know what the recidivism rates look like. So the answer to your question at a very simple level is, is absolutely, it's, it's incredibly important and it's incredibly important to the kinds of skills people will need for jobs in the future. Great, well thank you very Great. much.